Hey everybody, this is Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University, and this video is made for my Microbiology and Infectious Diseases course. And in this video, we're going to look at the structure of a gram-positive envelope. The envelope is the interface between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. Some people refer to that as the cell wall. That's not technically correct. The envelope is the multiple layers. The wall is simply the peptidoglycan structure. Um, but if you hear people talking about the cell wall in a more general sense, understand they probably mean all the layers of the envelope. So in a gram positive, there are really only two layers to the envelope, the cell membrane and the cell wall. And we're going to look at the structure and function of each of those. Before we do that, I want to remind you where the gram positives fall out uh, genetically in relationship to other living things. So the gram positives, when we talk about gram positive and gram negative bacteria, it's super essential. You really need to understand this. Uh, if, if there were three or four takeaways from a microbiology class that you've just got to hold on to going forward, one of them would be the distinction between gram positives and gram negatives. It's just that important, that fundamental to what we do. But what I want you to recognize is that we only use that terminology, gram positive, gram negative, among the bacteria. Right? The bacteria are their own branch, their own domain on the tree of life. We don't talk about gram positive or gram negative archaea or eukarya. Uh, because they simply don't have these structures. And then if you look at the domain bacteria, you notice that the gram-positive bacteria get their own branch. And in fact, there are a couple branches that hold the gram-positives. Uh, one branch is called the firmicutes, which means thick or tough skin. That's where we find most of the pathogens that are gram-positive. So your staphylococci, your streptococci, clostridium, etc. There is another branch, I don't know where it belongs on the tree, so I'm just going to put it right here, called the actinobacteria. Uh, there are some pathogens in there, but fewer. They're more soil organisms. They're really interesting in that they, they behave and they're structured very similar to the fungi. Uh, they can be multicellular, they can have hyphae and, and budding reproductive type uh, structures associated with them. And yet the fungi are way over here on the right side in a completely different domain. So we have uh, these different groups of organisms that genetically are completely distinct, share no life history, and yet they've arrived at very, very similar, um, ultimately, life um, strategies. It's, it's a really interesting thing. But we're going to primarily focus on these guys right here, the firmicutes. So let's take a look at what... Um, <clears throat> what these bacteria look like in a microscope first. And here's one of the reasons that we need to zoom in, because when you look at gram negatives like E. coli or gram positives, like Listeria monocytogenes, there's no way to tell that they're gram positive or gram negative just by looking at them in the microscope. They look identical. They're just short little rod-shaped bacteria. Where they're going to look different is when we zoom in on one of them and we slice through the envelope, that skin around them, that interface between the outside and the inside, and we look at the layers that are there. We're going to find that E. coli looks completely different from Listeria. Uh, both of these are pathogens. E. coli, there's some, some good, healthy, safe uh, E. coli that live in our gut that do some great things, um, but if they get in the wrong area, like in the urinary tract, they can cause infection, and then there are other really nasty E. coli's like strain 0157H7 that can kill people. And so there's a whole range of different versions, if you will. We call them strains or serovars of E. coli, cause a variety of illness. Listeria causes a disease called listeriosis, which is a foodborne infection. Uh, and the thing about listeria that drives everybody nuts is that they're perfectly happy at 4 degrees Celsius, which is your refrigerator temperature. And so uh, if the foods were improperly handled prior to arriving at your house, putting them in the fridge is not going to help you. The listeria is still going to grow and it's still going to make you sick. We tend to see listeria outbreaks in uh, very soft, moist foods that are highly processed, like soft cheeses or deli meats. Uh, fortunately, it's, it's a very uncommon occurrence, and when it does happen, we try to get notifications out to everybody to watch out for certain brands. But we're going to slice into a listeria monocytogenes cell envelope right now as a representative gram positive, and we're going to see how it's structured. This is an image here from your textbook that you should learn and you should get comfortable with. Let's start with the cytoplasmic membrane. The cytoplasmic membrane is fundamental to all living things, period. Eukaryote, uh, prokaryote, and within prokaryotes, both bacteria and archaea, all living things have this cytoplasmic membrane. 
It really defines what's inside the cell from what's outside the cell. And the way that it does that is with these little guys here that are called phospholipids. These phospholipids have a hydrophilic head that interfaces nicely with the aqueous phase on either side of the bilayer. And they have hydrophobic tails that hate the water and so they all aggregate together. And they create an interior to the, the membrane that's very hydrophobic. And that hydrophobic membrane, that hydrophobic interior, creates a barrier then to things that are hydrophilic. So let's say you've got a, a sugar, and we know sugars uh, have a whole bunch of OHs and oxygens and other uh, polar bonds around them. And because of that polarity, they can't just simply diffuse across there. That hydrophobic interior is going to reject them. Another thing it would reject would be uh, ions. Anything with a full charge is going to be completely unwelcome in that interior. And what that means is that you now have a, a membrane, a barrier, that allows the cell to really determine what comes in and what goes out through what we call transport proteins. And there's a whole range of different types of transport proteins. Some are very general, some are very specific, some require energy, some don't require energy. But this whole process of being able to select what comes and what goes is referred to as selective permeability. And selective permeability is possibly the most fundamental distinction between something living and non-living. In fact, one of the ways that we distinguish a dead cell from a live cell is whether its cell membrane, its cytoplasmic membrane, is, uh, is still functioning in its selective permeability role. If it's no longer selectively permeable, anything can go out, anything can come in, and pretty soon you come to equilibrium with the environment and you don't have a living cell anymore. So the cytoplasmic membrane, absolutely essential. You notice they've drawn some proteins embedded in there. Uh, these are called integral membrane proteins. They have a wide range of functions, and we'll talk about those as they come up. Now, outside of the cytoplasmic membrane, there's this thick wall structure made out of a molecule called peptidoglycan. And peptidoglycan, you can imagine, um, uh, pretend this is like a, a flat sheet, if you will, of parallel strands of sugars, of polysaccharides, um, that's the glycan part of peptidoglycan, and then they're cross-linked periodically by short peptide bridges. Now the word peptide technically means protein, but we use the word peptide to refer to a very short protein. It's so short it can't even fold. And these short peptide bridges are nine or ten amino acids long, too short to ever fold into a um, into a three-dimensional structure. But what you have now is a rigid structure, almost like the screen on a screen door. It's very porous. Anything smaller than, say, uh, and this is just a, a rough estimate, but anything smaller than, for example, a disaccharide is gonna be able to slip through there very easily in both directions. It's that porous. Anything bigger is gonna to have to be broken down before it comes through, whether it's a waste product or, um, or a nutrient or whatever it happens to be. So this is a very porous material, and so most dissolved small substances on either side can come and go quite freely across the, uh, the peptidoglycan layer, but obviously not across the cytoplasmic membrane. Now, the main role of this peptidoglycan is to give physical structural support to the cell so that when it encounters shearing forces and compression forces, uh, it's not going to crush and you're not going to destroy that membrane and rupture the cell. There are a couple other molecules embedded in the peptidoglycan itself that are unique to gram positives. The first set we generically call wall-associated proteins. Don't mix those up with our integral membrane proteins down here in the membrane. The wall is not a membrane. Uh, but these wall-associated proteins have a variety of functions, some of which we know, some are still a mystery to us. But they are unique to the cell wall of gram positives. And then we have tachoic and lipotachoic acids. These tachoic acids are long polysaccharides with a bunch of negative charges, so they're hy highly hydrophilic. If we call it a tachoic acid, then it just goes from the outside environment and penetrates partway into the peptidoglycan. If we call it a lipotachoic acid, it's got an exposed section on the outside, a section that spans the peptidoglycan, and then a lipid region that locks it necessarily, because water will reject these lipids, locks it into the interior, that hydrophobic interior of the cytoplasmic membrane. 
The benefit, as far as we can tell, of these lipotachoic acids is to link the peptidoglycan wall, which is 40 sheets or more of these, uh, these peptide-linked long polysaccharides, just layer upon layer upon layer, to link this large, rough physical structure to this dainty little cytoplasmic membrane so that they're not moving across one another because the shearing forces of the peptidoglycan across the cytoplasmic membrane could very well rupture the membrane and kill the cell. So this ensures that they move together and you don't get any shearing forces across the surface. That's the basic structure of the envelope of a gram-positive bacterium like Listeria monocytogenes. Learn this really well. You should be able to recognize it and reproduce it along with all five of these key structures, the cytoplasmic membrane, the peptidoglycan, and then the three molecules that are found inside the peptidoglycan, lipotachoic acids, tachoic acids, and wall-associated proteins. And also make sure that you're comfortable, at least at a basic level, with the functions of these. Okay, let's summarize this short lesson. First, gram positives are on distinct branches in the domain bacteria. That's important to know. Uh, students will often ask me, can E. coli, can one strain of E. coli be gram negative and another strain be gram positive? No, okay. E. coli is E. coli and it's always gram negative. Gram positives are always gram positive and they're found on distinct branches within that domain bacteria. So it's genetically determined. There are only two layers to the envelope of a gram positive. That's the cell membrane and the cell wall. The membrane is a standard phospholipid bilayer, and incidentally, you can call it the cytoplasmic membrane, the cell membrane, or the plasma membrane, and they all mean exactly the same thing. Sorry about that. And its primary role is selective permeability, determining what comes in and what goes out. And then finally, the wall itself is made up of these layers of peptidoglycan, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 40 layers or even more in some cases. And they contain some unique molecules, the wall-associated proteins, tachoic and lipotachoic acids. And the, the role of the wall itself, not including the membrane, the role of the wall itself is physical structural support to maintain the integrity of the cell. Okay, that's it for the first lesson on gram positives. I hope you watch the second lesson as well on gram negatives where we'll contrast what the interior uh, of, of the envelope of an E. coli, as an example, uh, looks like.